tanto. Discipleship class at my church on Saturday mornings, and a couple of weeks ago, bear with me here, technical difficulties. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, both the pastors that usually um, help teach it were out for different funerals at the time. So it was just me and a 12-year-old guy at my church who's been coming to the class, which is super awesome. So after all my time of making fun of my pastor for taking weeks to get through one point in the class, I then spent the entire class on the first point that we were on. But we were talking about God, and he posed the question of, well, how— do do first how do i start telling people about god and then how do i prove that god is real and i i, I kind of turned the question back on him and asked well how do you prove that god is real and he went through a lot of the basic analogies of well we know that there must be a creator because you don't just see a building and expect that someone doesn't exist and like those are all awesome points but there are people in the world who are just going to deny that regardless and the one thing that we can always show forth is the testimonies of ourselves and those we know who have had radical changes in their lives. And so that's going to kind of be the basis for this one. I'm going to kind of talk about myself a bit, which I hate doing, which sounds like I'm trying to be humble, but I'm not. I'm super proudful, which is why I hate prideful, which is why I hate talking about myself, because looking at the totality of who I am in the absence of God, there is nothing to be proud of. There is nothing I can do or accomplish that is worth any amount of pride. And then, in fact, there's quite a bit of shame in my life. But it's through that shame, through those trials, and through those mistakes that I've made that God can shine forth. God can show that he can make something out of nothing and can use literally anyone because I'm up here. And like I said, I don't have much business being up here. But it's not really preaching if we don't get the Bible involved. And so we're going to go ahead and go through some of the parts of David's life, kind of because I share a name with him, and he's one of my favorite Bible characters. But there's a lot of back and forth in David's life, and there's a lot of really good life lessons we can learn. So we're going to start with 1 Samuel 17. If you've been in church for any length of time, and most people who haven't even been in church have heard the story of David and Goliath. But that's where we are going to start, because it's a cool story. We're going to start with verse... 40. If I can find that on the page. All right. So we're going to start uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 40 through 47. And he took a staff, he being David, in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in the, a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And I absolutely love David's reply to this. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and unto the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the truth that can be found in your word and the numerous applications and illustrations you give us to help navigate life, Lord. I just thank you for everything you've done for us, for your grace, for your mercy, and your willingness to continue using us despite our own shortcomings, Father. I'm just thankful for everything you do, and please bless the services this evening. In your name I pray. Amen. David trusted God and his ability to help him complete the task at hand. There's no doubt whatsoever in David's response to Goliath. He's staring at this giant man in armor and full weapons, a man of war, and his shield bearer, who were no slouches. It's not like they just picked a random person to be a shield bearer. They were pretty skilled at what they did too. And here comes a little shepherd boy with a scrap of leather and some stones like, no, you're not going to do what you just said. And in fact, I'm going to do that to you, and I'm going to take your head 
because you have defied my God, and he has put me here to go to battle with you. David knew Goliath had uh, his brothers. He had four brothers, and that he might have to fight them after Goliath. But he still had faith that God had provided him with what would be sufficient. In First Chronicles 20, verses 5 through 8, we kind of get a little bit of the backstory on Goliath's brothers. Uh, starting in verse 5, And there was a war again with the Philistines, and Elihanan, forgive my pronunciation of names, I'm terrible at it, the son of Jair uh, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. And yet again, there was war at Gath, where was a man of great stature whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot. And he also was the son of a, the giant. Kind of a strange-sounding fellow to have that many fingers and toes. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, Shimea David's brother, slew him. Th these were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. David put aside everything the world had to offer and trusted in what God had already proven and what God provided. In Back in the main text in 1 Samuel, uh, looking at verses 37 through 39, David said, moreover, that the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. But then Saul almost kind of, kind of takes a step back here and says, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. All too often, like Saul, we claim God's power. We claim that we trust in God. But then we drag along all the things the world thinks we need to do what we feel like we need to do. We put time and effort into speech classes and stuff like that, and by all means, if that helps you talk in front of people, great. But God doesn't call the qualified. If that were the case, I wouldn't be up here. He qualifies the willing. I have often wondered how many people have told God no to the call to preach if God has to use someone like me who is terrified of talking in front of people to be able to preach. It's not because I'm good at it. It's not because I have a gift at it. It's because God told me to, and I have no other option at this point in my life but to do what God asks. I was, uh, I grew up in church. I was saved at a very young age, and I was called, uh, I knew I was called to ministry uh, probably around seven-ish, give or take, but I was born with a cleft lip palate, which came with it some facial deformities, which plastic surgery is awesome. Thank you, God, for that, and a pretty severe lisp, which I still have, if you haven't noticed, and it still kind of bothers me uh, subconsciously, but I was super discouraged by this. Like Moses, when God told Moses to go and talk to Pharaoh. Moses like, uh, I, I, I can't talk to you, good God. Like, why are you sending me? And Moses tried using that as an excuse. And that's a pretty valid excuse. If you don't know how to talk or you can't talk well, can't speak well, I guess would be the proper English for it. But if you can't do those things well, it's a pretty valid reason. Like, uh, I'm not good at that, so I'm not going to do it. Like the brother over here, I, I'm terrified of singing, but he got up and did it because that was what was required, which was awesome. Regardless of how your performance was, you got up here, and that was amazing. But I got really discouraged by this. I got discouraged by my own self-doubt and the doubt of others and the comments made by others. We, uh, My brother and I went to a private school uh, that was attached to the church and went to at the time. And uh, private school kids can be awful. I mean, all kids are pretty awful. No offense. <laughs> But um, they they ridiculed me mercilessly. And then we ended up uh, being homeschooled for a little while. And then my brother and I, because we were um, absolute torment for my poor mother and uh, made things horrible for her, she's like, fine, we're sending you to public school for the last two years. So junior and senior year, we went to public school. And here I went to this horrible institution that I'd heard all my life was this absolutely abhorrent thing, which it is. But I heard all these awful things about public school and how mean the kids were only to find that I was accepted for me, and people liked me, and people treated me well, and I wasn't made fun of. So now I was faced with this, this schism between what I was taught and what I was experiencing of the people who were supposed to be Christians, who were supposed to be godly, were treating me horribly, and the people who weren't were treating me well. And I got really, really bitter at God. I got very angry at the church, and I allowed that to drive a wedge between me and God, and I stepped away from it. 
I still went to church because my parents kind of made me, and it was the right thing to do, and I knew God was still real. I still knew God was my God, but I didn't really want anything to do with him. I was kind of done with whatever he wanted me to do. And I just, I was so angry about, I was also a scrawny, awkward kid, like I was telling him I couldn't do jumping jacks until I was like 14. So on top of the list, I was just a goofy, lanky kid. So I didn't have a lot going for me. And I hated that. I hated everything that God had created me. I hated every part of what my God, who makes no mistakes, who says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I hated every part of it. I despised who I was. I hated who I saw in the mirror. So I did everything I could to be the exact opposite. I got into martial arts, I got into working out, and I sought employment as a bouncer, and then I worked as a bodyguard for some uh, foreign diplomats, and I was able to prove my ability. I was actually really good at it, and I succeeded. But the problem was, through those experiences, through the fights I was in and everything else, when you're called to preach particularly, and you seek out a career where your job is basically just hurting people, it destroys your soul. It erodes your confidence, and it eats away at who you are as a person. And so because of the things I sought out, I had nightmares. I had a bunch of issues I dealt with. But instead of actually dealing with it, I figured, hey, you know what? I don't believe anything I really grew up with anyway, so I'm going to use alcohol. So I began drinking uh, probably around 20 and drank heavily because, hey, that I took away the pain. I didn't care about how much I hated myself. I didn't care about how much I hated God. I could sleep at night. So I drank a lot. Instead of trusting in God and having faith that he could accomplish the tasks that he had, tasks that he had put before me with the abilities he had given me, I chose to seek to improve my perceived ability in the ways of the world, and it nearly led to my ruin, just as it did with David later in his life. Turn to Second Samuel. Chapter 24. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4 to start with. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. Excuse me. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they be, an hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth, the lord, why doth my lord the king delight in this? Notwithstanding, the king's word, uh, word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host, and Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. David grew confident. He had, by this point in his career as a king, he had slayed giants, he had conquered armies, he was an accomplished man of war and the greatest king of Israel. He was so confident in the kingdom he was reigning over that he had forgotten that it was God who gave him that kingdom and God that established that kingdom. Like many of us, David began to view the accomplishments God had done through him as accomplishments that were of his own doing. This led to pride and the deaths of so many in his kingdom. Later on in this chapter in verse 15, So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel from morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. The cost of David's pride and thinking that he had accomplished anything on his own cost 70,000 thousand people their lives. Let that sink in for a moment. One person's decision decision costs that many people their lives. While I've certainly, I, at least I don't think I've cost that many people their lives, my pride has cost so much in my own life, and I can't help but wonder how many people I've missed the opportunity to witness to in the time span of like the 10 years I spent doing my own thing. How many people never were ministered to, never heard of God's goodness because I was busy doing my own thing, because I was focused on what I wanted to do and how much I could prove God wrong by showing I could do what I wanted to do. There's always a steep cost when we trust in our own ability. The Israelites grew tired of God's blessing and began to lust after the things of the world. In Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6, and the mixed multitude that was among them 
fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish uh, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. God was continuing to provide for the children of Israel as he does for each of us. But because they weren't getting what they wanted, they grew restless with God. God had provided me with abilities and talents and gifts, but I wasn't content with them. I wanted something else. I wanted anything that wasn't on the menu. And so I complained. I doubted God. I got angry at God. Not only did Israel's constant complaining lead discontent with what God had given them, it allowed doubt in God's providence to creep in. This set the stage for them pursuing other gods, provoking Moses to anger, leading to strike the rock twice, and ultimately doubting whether or not God could deliver the promised land to them out of the hand, uh, hands of the giants. When we allow ourselves to doubt God's ability with the little things in our lives, it creates a pattern of distrust that prevents us from trusting him in the big things and missing out on the blessings he has in the store. If I can't trust God to take care of making sure I have clothes to wear, which y'all are welcome, he provided clothes for me, and all these little things in my life, I'm never going to be able to trust him when a big decision comes up or I lose my job or I lose my house. I'm not going to be able to trust him because I've never established that pattern of being able to trust in God. I haven't proved his words to be true in my own life. There's always also a great reward when we heed God's call. We go over to 1 Kings 17, and I'm going the wrong way. And we're going to look at verses 7, uh, 7 through 16, excuse me. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarpath, Zarpath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarpath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but an handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. What a level of despair to be at the point of, we have this little bit of food left, we might as well just eat what we have, so we can go ahead and just die. There, there's nothing left for us, we've run out of substance, we're just going to die. And here's this random guy saying he's from God, telling me, hey, I need you to give me what you have, because I'm, I'm kind of thirsty and hungry, could you, could you take care of my needs for a minute? But, Thankfully, she doesn't think like I do, and she, she followed God. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. And for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall a cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and she and her she and he yeah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of wheel wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. There's a song that I absolutely love. The uh, I think the title is Little as Much When God is in it. This shows how much God can do with so little. We may think that we have an in a small ability in something we may think that we don't have much to offer, but it doesn't matter how much we have to offer. What matters is what God can do with that thing. It doesn't matter if we have a tiny amount of talent when it comes to singing. When you sing, we sing. If we need to preach, we preach. If we need to witness to someone, we witness to someone, not because we have so much to offer, but because God can do so much with so little. When we have faith in what God gives us, it becomes more than we could ever have hoped for. God can and will use you wherever you're at in life with whatever gifts or abilities you have as long as you're standing in the right place. So after this, the period of 
doing my own thing, drinking alcohol, living a life that was indistinguishable from the world. Um, I was on vacation, and my brother, having the random idea, it was probably 9 or 10 at night, like, hey, let's drive to Idaho. We had a friend from our church growing up that had moved out there. He's like, hey, we've never been there. Let's go visit him. No, we're, we're not going to randomly drive to Idaho in the middle of the night. I've never been there. It's dark. No, we're not doing that. That's dumb. My brother, being persistent, was like, no, we should totally do it. It's a good idea. And this went back and forth, and then come to find out he had messaged Charles, our friend, and like, oh, yeah, he said we can come and just show up at his house. Like, it, it'll be like 4 in the morning. That's, we're not going to show up at someone's house at 4 in the morning. It's like, no, no, no. He said he'd be getting up for work at that time. It's fine. Let's go. So off we went to Idaho, somewhere I'd never been in the middle of the night. I don't know how we didn't get lost because there's no signal between where I lived in Tacoma and Lewiston, Idaho. So we somehow managed to make it. And when we got there, we got about an hour of sleep. And the church there um, has men's prayer breakfast every quarter or so. And that happened to be one of the days they were having men's prayer breakfast. So Charles invited my brother and I, and we went along. And through the men's prayer breakfast, I don't even remember what they even spoke about at the men's prayer breakfast. I just remember having the sudden dread and realization that I had turned my back on everything. I had betrayed my God. I had betrayed my family. I had done everything I had swore I would never do as a child because I knew what I should have done, and I didn't do it. And I broke down and bawled my eyes out when we knelt down to pray and got things right with God in that moment. And it was an amazing moment, but it was a very difficult moment to get through. And after that, we had a good time, spent time with Charles, his wife, his kids. And the whole weekend, Charles is joking, hey, you can move to Idaho. N no, I'm not moving to Idaho. I have a good job. I like where I'm at. I'm doing my thing. I'm, I'm not moving to Idaho. I'm good. I'll just go back and serve God where I'm at. No, no, no. Come on, move out to Idaho. It's fine. I don't have a place to live. I don't have a job out here. No, I'm not moving. Oh, you can live in our garage until you find a place. I, I don't want to live in your garage. No offense. No, 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 it's fine. Come on out. And I kept fighting it, kept fighting it. And again, like my brother being persistent, apparently I'm just a sucker for peer pressure. Um, but by the end of the weekend, it's like, I, I think I have to move out to Idaho. I remember driving back with my brother and just kind of looking over at him. It's like, um, I, I, I think I'm moving to Idaho. <laughs> He's like, wait, really? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to do it. So I kind of made some preparations. I quit my job a couple of months later, and I moved to Idaho and stayed in Charles's garage. I, I'm so thankful for his wife for putting up with that. I don't know why she decided to go ahead and allow that, but I'm so thankful for her patience with me. And it was, it was awesome, but the, the first step of that broken heart, that's what God requires for us to make a change in our lives. He calls for a broken and contrite spirit. We can't just half-heartedly say, hey, God, you know, I'm sorry I did that thing or whatever. It's like the child who's apologizing for something that they did all the while they have attitude and they're rolling their eyes like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. That's not what God wants from us. That's not repentance. That's lip service, and that doesn't please God in the least. We have to reach the point where we truly understand the gravity of what we've done against our God and beg him for mercy, but he is faithful and just to always forgive us of our sins and to always give us mercy if we do that. So I move out there, and I eventually got a job at the prison out there, and while working at that prison, I was faced with a pretty big challenge of my faith and learning how to love your neighbors. I remember one particular guy in the prison who, by all rights, was an absolute monster. I won't go into what he did because of the mixed company, but he was a horrible, horrible human being that deserved the worst possible punishment. And I remember I had read um, the passage about loving God and then loving your neighbor as yourself. I'm like, okay, God, but I, I can't love this person. This person is the definition of evil. There's no way I can bring myself to love this person. They don't deserve my love. And it was at that moment that I realized, wait, I don't deserve God's love either. There's nothing I could do to deserve God's love. There's no repentance I can do that makes me deserve God's love. The reason I get God's love is because he freely gives it to me. And that's what he expects from each of us. And so I had to learn how to love this person, how to greet them each morning with a smile and be kind and caring to this awful human being. I don't, I don't think it made any difference, but it wasn't the difference it made in him. It was what I needed to do is what I had to do. That's what God expects of us because that's what God gives us. 
we are filthy sinners and there's no way we, we can cut it that makes us any better than any other human being on this planet. We all have the same sin nature. The Bible clearly says if we're guilty of one sin, we're guilty of them all. God doesn't see it as this very thing of, oh, you know, that was just a lie. It's not like you killed anyone. I guess it's okay. No, sin is sin, and we have to recognize that. But I continue to grow. I continue to get little opportunities to help. I remember the first thing the pastor there asked me to do was they used this horrible water-based paint for the walls. Why they chose it, I don't know. But you literally brush across it, and it would rub the paint away, and so there are little white splotches all over the wall, and it drove him nuts. He's an absolute perfectionist. It's really hilarious to turn a little chair just slightly, because he will notice in the middle of a service, and it will bother him. But he's that kind of perfectionist. And so he asked, I asked if there's anything I can do. He's like, yeah, take this little can of paint and finger paint the wall. Go around and touch up those splotches. All right, sure, that's ridiculous, but I can do that. Whatever I can do to help. And then more random little things will come up. And eventually, through continually just doing the menial tasks that need to be done at church, one day he had to go out of town. He's like, hey, you know, you've been, you've been helping out. You've been consistent and faithful. Can you preach for me Wednesday night? Okay, how? What, what, I, don't, I don't even know what I need to do. It's like, oh, don't worry about it. Pray about it. You'll figure it out. You'll be fine. Do, do you want to look over my notes or anything? No, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> I think it lasted maybe 10 minutes. But it was the first experience of, I have no idea how to do this. I have no ability to do this. I don't even know where to start. Sat down with my Bible and begged God to give me something. And he did. It was short, but he gave me something. And that was the first time God had shown me that, hey, it doesn't matter that you can't do this. I can do this. You were asked to do this, so you're going to do it by my strength. And that's what God has to offer us. We don't have to know how to do something. God provides the answers and the knowledge we need if we're doing what he asked us to do. One of my favorite verses that comes from the story of the prodigal son is something that caught me off guard and is absolutely amazing. But let's go ahead and move, go over to Luke 15, and we'll read through that little passage there. This is kind of at the middle to end of the story where... The prodigal son is realizing, hey, I've messed up. I've, I've really made a mess of my life. I, I got to go back to my dad. So we're going to start in verse 18, and we're going to read down to verse 24. 15, thank you. Chapter 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. You don't just happen to see someone a great way off. To me, that tells me the father was looking for him, hoping for him, desperately begging his son to come home. He saw him a great way off. That means he was waiting for his son to come home. Knowing all well what his son had done, the disrespect he had showed his father by demanding his inheritance. But he saw him a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. This is an earthly father waiting for his son to come home. Our heavenly father continually sits there. Something Brandon and I noticed, uh, Brandon House and I noticed when going through the minor prophets, was so often interspersed between God pronouncing horrible judgments like, judging the people of Israel, saying they will have barren wombs and a whole bunch of other horrendous curses upon them for their sins, there was usually a break of a verse or two talking about how God was waiting to heal them if they would just repent. Even in the Old Testament, before Christ had ever died, God was still willing to heal his people if they but repented. How much more is he willing to heal us and waiting to heal us now that we have Christ and his sacrifice for our sins? God is waiting for us to return to him, waiting for us to make that choice, 
to go back to him, to repent and turn to him. He's waiting for that. Like I mentioned earlier today, there's no period of uncleanness. You don't have to wait for anything other than yourselves. The only thing that can limit God's ability to make a difference in our lives is our own stubbornness. We can, in this very moment, yield ourselves completely to God and begin to be used by God, but we have to yield. There are a couple of steps we can look at in David's life to develop our walk with God and our confidence in God. David was with his brothers for a period, but returned to his duties his father had assigned him. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 15, we see, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. All too often we want to do the, the big thing. So in ministry, we want to be able to preach and witness and do all these things. But that is such a small part of ministry. Ministry is just that ministering to people. And sometimes that means ministering to your OCD pastor by making sure things are neat and orderly. It's not about doing the big things or the things that gain us notoriety or attention. It's about doing whatever we can, wherever we can, to help God and help his work. If that means being a good church member and supporting your pastor, so be it. It is frustrating for pastors when they have church members and they have maybe one or two people that do so much in the church, but there's so much more that needs to be done and people just aren't doing it. They show up to church, they're faithful at church, they give, they do all these things, but they're not willing to take that next step to commit. It's not enough for us to just show up. It's not enough for us to just do the minimum. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to continue in our service to God. And that starts with asking where you can help. It can be straightening songbooks. It can be help pass out flyers. It can be cooking food for a potluck. There's a million different little ways we can support our church and support our pastors. And this is coming from someone who's not a pastor. I get nothing out of this. I just have I've heard pastors express their heartache, and I want to do everything I can to try to help my pastor. We should have that desire because our pastors do so much for us. Our pastor's families do so much for us. It's amazing. David was, a willing, David was willing to be a servant in verse uh, 17 of chapter 17. And Jesse said unto his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the, the camp of thy brethren. This is the, a simple errand. This is a servant's errand that David's dad asked of him. And yet David was willing to do it. It didn't matter that he wasn't getting to stay on the battlefield and get that glory. It didn't matter that he had to come back and tend to his sheep. He went and did as his father told him and took some food to his brothers. But it was because of that faithful service that David was given the opportunities he was given. David made sure his daily duties were looked after and then was diligent in his service of others. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 20, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. David made sure his duties were taken care of. He didn't just abandon his sheep. He didn't just neglect his other responsibilities. He still took care of them and then went forth and did what his father told him to do. We also see that David saw a need and asked who was taking care of it. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David saw a wrong that was being perpetrated. He saw someone defying his God and his nation, and saw that no one was doing anything about it. He saw a need and asked, hey, what's, what's being done about this? Who's taking care of this guy? Because we clearly shouldn't be letting this happen. This needs to be addressed. Why is no one addressing this? And we know kind of how that went. When you realize no one was taking care of the problem, rather than complain like, ugh, I can't believe no one's taking out that trash. What a bunch of bums and walking away from it. David saw a need, and when no one else was taking care of it, he took care of it, even though he was the least qualified to even be there. He was still a kid. He wasn't trained as a soldier, but he was still willing because no one else was taking care of it. In uh, 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. 
And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Again, we see David building his trust in God through doing his daily duties. Being a sheep keeper is a pretty menial task, but every once in a while you might have to fight a lion or you might have to fight a bear. What that can look like in our church lives is being ready to go and support someone. Say someone's lost a loved one, lost a job, or is going through a hard time. We can go and we can support that person. We don't have to wait for our pastor to go and minister to that person because I'm sure the pastor will, but he also has a million other things on his mind. We can go to that person. We can offer a kind word. We don't have to understand what they're going through. We don't have to go and tell them, oh, brother, I know what you're going through. That's rough. I went through something similar. We don't have to do any of that. We just have to go and tell them, hey, brother, you're going through a hard time. I'm praying for you. I love you. I'm here if you need anything. It's that easy. It's that simple. And that's where we can start seeing something that needs to be done and taking responsibility for it. We shouldn't wait for a pastor or someone in a position of ministry to minister to the people in our church. We have that same duty, and we have that same ability to be a blessing to others. We build confidence in God through our daily faithful execution of our duties, whether they're great or small. It is always the right time to do the right thing. I don't know what giants you may be facing in life. I know I've certainly had a few in my own life, and I would just like to encourage you to trust God and focus on the things in front of you. David took enough stones for Goliath and his brothers. He was focused on Goliath and the giant in front of him. Maybe you're like me and you face giants in your life and you've charged at them with all the ferocity you can muster. Then you still fall flat because you're tripped up on everything you're dragging behind you from the world. Take this opportunity, take tonight, to set aside those weights which doth so easily beset us. Not necessarily sins in our lives that trip us up, though that's often the case. They can also just be carrying on things like anxiety or depression or frustration. Let those things go. Let go of the things that are keeping you from serving God. Maybe it's, I'm shy, I don't know how to talk to people, or I'm, I'm socially awkward, so I can't go talk to this person. Let that go. It doesn't matter. And the Word of God won't return void. If you go with the Word of God, God will bless you for it. It doesn't matter what you think you're capable of. What matters is what God thinks you're capable of, and he has a pretty high opinion of what he can do through us. Proverbs 24, 16 is the verse we'll end with. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. This doesn't say that a just man never falls. It says that the just man gets back up. Don't be discouraged because you find yourself in a place in life where you feel you shouldn't be. That's, that's something that comes up. Be encouraged by the fact that God is waiting for you to get back up and is willing to help you take that next step. When Peter took his eyes off Christ and began to sink in the water, the first thing Christ did was reach out his hand and help him up. And then he explained to Peter what he did wrong. God's first response is to help us, and then he will help us learn from that mistake. But God is standing ready to help us. Before David ever went to face Goliath, he took care of his father's sheep. Everyone can bow their head and close their eyes. Like I said, it doesn't take something special to make that change in your life. All it takes is that one decision, that one choice that can start tonight. If you're holding something or you've been carrying a burden or something that's just too heavy for you to bear, now is the time to let that go and begin to be used by God. You can give that up. You don't have to carry it. You don't have to carry the shame of your choices. Christ died for our sins and our shame. Yes, there are costs to our sin, but God is willing to redeem us and continue using us regardless of that if we are willing to repent. If you've never repented of your sins and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I beg you, take the opportunity to do so. It is the greatest decision you can ever make in your lives. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to once again preach. Lord, I pray that if anyone has a decision or a heavy heart, they're willing to, to take that next step, willing to follow after you, Father. Give us the courage and the faith to follow after what you have put before us, Lord. Please bless this time of invitation the rest of this evening. In your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand for a brief song by our wonderful...